today's talk, I've talked quite a bit about visual supports in the past. It's something I feel like we can never talk enough about. Um, it's one of the most, um, I feel like, powerful strategies we can use for individuals that need additional supports, and we use it in our day-to-day -day life. And sometimes I think we underestimate the simplicity of visual supports with the power, right, for um, the individuals we work with. So today, I have geared much of my um, talk and examples specifically around families and within the home environment, but I will do my best to make sure I include um, examples for the school and other professional environments, but it's very um, easy to generalize everything that we're talking about today. So I'm going to go through some specific um, visual supports. Please know that each one of these that I'm going to talk about, you could spend a couple hours learning about. Um, so my goal is to kind of plant a seed or maybe spark an idea. I kind of feel like if you leave here with a new idea or kind of an aha thought, or I had never thought of doing that before, then this hour and a half with me hopefully was worth it. That's kind of my goal. So there's a lot of ideas. Um, having said that, I think sometimes as professionals and parents, it can be overwhelming. You see something and you're like, I should do that. I'm going to start that. I should make that. And then we make a lot of stuff or we go get a lot of stuff and then we look at it and we kind of get stuck. Has that ever happened to anyone? Or you search on the internet for ideas and then you wonder why you ever did that, right? Because <laughs> you get more ideas than you need. So I think I just want to tell you, take this with general information. I try to provide a lot of samples. I try to give you ideas of how to apply it. Just be thinking the whole time, is there something that you feel like for your student or for your child or for your situation, could this work and could this be meaningful? Um, and then think of how you could use that. So I'm hopefully we'll give you some tips as we go through. But no, it is, I know it's a lot of content and ideas, but I kind of wanted to give you an overview of what I view as some of the most critical visual supports. Sound good? Okay. So we're going to talk about, give an overview, like I said, different types of visual supports, and then also I'm going to spend some time talking about social narratives at the end. Social narratives, I'm going to give you resources to go get additional information too, but I'm, like I said, I'm introducing it. So we're talking about visual supports and social narratives. It's important to know that both, both of these have been identified as evidence-based practices for individuals with autism, okay? So which means there's substantial research that shows that they have positive results in a nutshell. So when you hear evidence-based, that usually means there's been a like an assessment of the research available for each of these strategies, and they look at the different studies. And from those studies, we show that there's a positive impact for learners with autism for use in these, um, with visual supports and social narratives. Having said that, um, these strategies are applicable to individuals with di diverse skills and abilities and disabilities. So I don't want you to think that um, if you sit here and you're working with or Okay, <clears throat> I don't want you to think it doesn't apply, because it most definitely does. In this beginning part, we're going to kind of remind ourselves how we use visual supports in our day-to-day -day life. So we're going to start with a quiz. I hope you guys are ready for this. Um, have your thinking caps on and super hard. If you don't pass, I'm going to ask you to leave afterwards. Um, okay, first one, just go ahead and shout it out what this is. Anybody? No, nobody? Not the square, the word. But I love that you guys told me orange. That even goes to what we're going to talk about, right? Anyone? OK, what is it? What do you think Homan means? Or what the sign man's, man's bathroom? OK, what about Poisson? Look at you, smarty pants. What about Melin? Woman? Let's see. What about now? What do you think it means? Art. That's right. What about Petite de J. Mer? Breakfast. I've got some bilingual folks in here. What about Eisenbahn? Now what is it? Train. So the power of visual supports with spoken and written language that might not be understood to all learners, if you add a visual context to it, it makes us all immediately independent and it allows access. And at the end of the day, that's our goal, right? So obviously, several of you speak multiple languages. So you are at an advantage with the word, and we were at a disadvantage. But when I added the visual, I now had the same understanding you did by just reading the word. So the power of visuals, it happens everywhere in our everyday life. Um, and it's more critical for individuals who struggle 
right, with reading and listening and verbal processing that we consider how to incorporate visual supports in our instructions in our day-to-day -day life to allow them to be as successful and independent. Okay, so visual supports, really this seems straightforward, but really it's anything that we see with our eyes, right, that provides information. We want to make the visual supports take the auditory information and make them visual. So what we say, we want to make it visual to what we can see, okay? So think about in your daily lives. What types of visual, visual supports do you use? You can call it out. Traffic signs, Traffic signs? great. Say it again. Gestures. gestures. So what kind of gestures do you use? The nice gestures. <laughs> <laughs> sign. If you do sign and others sign, but do most of in our general um, community, if you're not around others that share that same language, is that something we typically use? No, it's when we have that shared language between us, right? So traffic signs, anything else? Calendar. Calendar. Model, you guys, are the, you guys are very professional with me right now. These are very fancy examples. Modeling behavior, you're right. So seeing others do what we um, need to be doing, right, or looking to others for cues and information. So just some thoughts. Any of you use a map to get here today? Maybe it didn't look like this. Maybe it was on an app, show of hands, map, some form or other. Okay, great. And it seemed to have worked. You're here. It's fantastic. Um, how many of your map didn't work? Anyone? Didn't make it to the right location, right building? You're good, found registration, okay. What about how many of you use your phone for a timer, any other timers? Okay, it's visual support. Um, what about post-it notes? I have my pile on my desk right now at this conference. I'm like, this represents my brain on post-it notes. Like every note stacked on another one, right? To remember, okay, post-its, visual support, right? Um, let's see what else. Grocery store, would you consider these visual supports? Yeah, so let me tell you what happens when we don't have these. So are you all pretty independent? How many of you have grocery shopped on your own? <laughs> yeah, perfect. So you did a really good job, so I'm thinking you're super independent, so the next store you go into, there's nothing. Would that make sense? Would we pull out all of our visual supports because we did it well once or we're independent? So it's a big thing with individuals with different learning styles and abilities that we tend to provide a support and get them to a level of independence and then think for some reason we should fade or remove that support, right? Because maybe we shouldn't have that. But think about your own life, what allows you to be independent and successful. So I have an example of the grocery store a store we shop in in my, house, uh, my hometown, completely decided to do one of these fancy dancy remodel where they move everything. <clears throat> so I walked in and I literally, I had 10 minutes to grab like five things and I saw they had completely like flipped. I mean, everything was where it wasn't supposed to be. And I turned around to leave. Like I had this moment of like, I wanted to have probably a tantrum, but instead I was like avoiding, right, the situation. And I'm like, okay, breathe. So I started looking around for information. I relied solely on the visual supports to try to be efficient and independent, but because something changed without warning, I had no, no one warned me, I had no transition cue, I didn't have any prep, I walked in, my husband didn't even tell me, and he'd been to, he likes to shop, which is really great. Uh, I know, I think that's why I married him, don't tell him that. But he goes into the grocery store, and he didn't warn me, and I'm looking around. I relied on the aisles and the tags. Now, what's interesting, because I was there partway through, I went down an aisle and I read, because I'm a reader, so I could access that, right? And I read, it wasn't on there. They're like, oh, we haven't moved those yet. Like, they were mid-switch. So I was using the visual support, and this is something that's super interesting for individuals of all disabilities and individuals with autism specifically. We know that there's a component where there's not a typical development for self-advocacy, knowing how to self-advocate. But because I have that ability, once I relied on the visual supports and they didn't give me the information I needed, I needed to turn to look to someone and ask for help, right? Um, so I used appropriate verbal language and tried to keep my tone really nice and friendly, and I asked them. <laughs> Where the heck, you know, the bread went. Um, so it's the component, it's the connection between our visual supports, right, and the other skills we need to teach all learners. 
students, children, adults, the ability to access visual supports in our world around us, and then this, the other additional skills, um, we call them compensatory skills that support that, right? So I, if I can't find what I'm looking for, how do I ask for help? And so my goal always is to make this meaningful in our life. I feel like anything we do to work with individuals with differing ab ability levels, we first need to understand the power in our own life because then we get the value in others. So without that, we think we're just making a visual or a help or a choice board as a thing. But we don't understand that a choice board we make for a kiddo is like our menu when we go out to dinner. Right? So if we can really think about the power of visuals in our own life and how many things, right, we use, our phone, to-do lists, shopping lists, that we know we need and we create independently, our goal is to teach others and show others the power of them and then teach them how to do that for themselves as well. So those are those components. So really our life is full of these visual supports. Um, the phone, I mean, how many of you, a smartphone or device would be lost without? I mean, think of all the apps in there. I mean, check, there's a timer, thank heaven. The calculator, the to-do list. The, oh, that's the best, right? Everything we have in that. But if you're super independent, so you've made your appointments, Amber, for the week, you know what you don't get anymore? Your calendar, right? Would we ever do that, take away the visual supports? Um, in our own lives, no. So we need to think what can be lo also life-lasting life and age-appropriate is also a big thing we have to consider when we're developing visual supports for our learners. Um, so we know visual supports help assist with communication and understanding. They capitalize on a learner's visual strengths. That seems pretty straightforward. But if you have a learner who's really an amazing auditory learner, they probably could still benefit from visual supports, but the power might not be the same as those that have really a, a visual strength in learning or can access that independently. Um, they provide lasting information. We're going to talk about this a little bit when I talk about the weight card. And um, so they're concrete, right? You can, you can see it. You can hold on to it. You can reference it. It's not fleeting. Um, and it clarifies concepts and expectations. So you can use visual supports to really set some clear expectations for your kiddos or for your students or for anyone that you're working with. And ultimately, the main goal for anything that I ever talk about is you know, the goal of independence. Our goal for any type of learner and student, typical developing or atypical development, is that we teach independent skills so they can be successful and follow their chosen path or their chosen interests. And so part of it is knowing you might have a student or a child that you're like, oh, they, we do all this. I have all this for him or her. But maybe you haven't taken the next step to teach them how to think of what visual supports they might need to create. Does that make sense? So maybe you've done an amazing job making them checklists or to-dos, right? Or you have a calendar for them or a school planner and you plan it for them, but they haven't taken the step of learning the value of that support and the skills needed to start doing it for themselves. So those, there's those two pieces to it. So really, it's shifting our focus. It's pretty straightforward, but from telling, really, I always ask, did we show? That's how I learn. Any of you learn by seeing? If someone rattled off, like, so here's what I need you to do. So I might have talked to many of you on the phone to register. If I called you and said, OK, you ready? But don't write any of this down. The conference starts at 7.30. You need to register. You're going to have breakfast. There's going to be some lunch. You have three sessions. You're in session 3, 11, and 12. You get lunch. You, right? If I started doing that, and I'm like, so I hope to see you there. Would, how many of you do you think, A, would love me very much, probably not, but also not get here? So really, we do a lot of showing, the emails, the reminders, the alerts, right? We have that built in. So really shifting our focus. Sometimes I tell people, like, just because we're talking more doesn't mean we're helping. We're kind of hindering sometimes more information. But sometimes we feel better. Like, well, I just wanted to explain it again. Maybe we can show somebody so they can understand. So from shifting, from telling, and showing. So a couple of questions for visual supports. I get asked this quite a bit. How do you determine the best kind of visual support to use? So these are some basic questions to think about. Does your child reach for desired objects, right? Can they reach for, or does your student reach for desired objects? Um, do they point at photographs, right? Or look at pictures, or people? Do they recognize? So that could be even like logos, or food, or cereal boxes, or pictures and books, those types of labels. Um, and then looking at pictures and books and naming objects. 
So the reason why we go through this, because you can use visual supports that are just the object themselves, and developmentally, that's appropriate for some of our learners. Or you can use photographs, right? Or you can use colored icons or pictures. So there's a wide array of choices available to you when you're thinking about visual supports that you can really walk through and just ask yourself what type of learner you're working with and adjust accordingly. And I have some um, resources I'm gonna give you at the end too. So after this quick talk, you can go and spend time and actually just look up and listen to others talking about visual supports with some great resources and some tools to try to pick the best ones for your learner. Um, so there's a, there's a ton of visual supports, so I chose to talk about the ones I think are most critical and also um, pretty good bang for your buck. So not a lot of prep to do, pretty great outcomes. Um, I probably put more in here than I should. I jokingly told Aben I'll just keep talking really fast like I always do. But um, so schedules. Schedules is huge. Visual schedules. There's a full module you can watch for two and a half hours to really set it up right in your home. Or you can click through. But I'm going to give you just kind of an introduction to it, right? So we're going to talk about schedules briefly. We're going to talk about rules, visual rules. We're going to talk about first then boards, choice boards, um, different cues for teaching, and then token boards. Okay, so those are the, the ones we're going to cover during the visual supports. How many of you have heard of some of these? Okay, great. Any of you currently using first then boards with your kiddos? Perfect. And what about token boards? Okay, great. Choice boards? Okay. Um, and then help break and wait, cues for teaching. I'm just going to be talking about help break and wait. Any of you use those visual cues with your students? A couple of you. Okay. Perfect. One thing, too, I want to remind you, um, we do have a make and take session um, during the conference. There's a couple different sessions. Um, it is structured with material until we run out um, to make some of these visual supports and samples. And I'll show you kind of a sample of what you can pick up in there as well. Um, but I also have a great resource where you can print out a lot of this free. There's an online, um, online website that has a free board that you can download visuals and everything. So we'll talk about that. Okay, so first, schedules. Really, the goal of visual schedules is to reduce anxiety and help individuals prepare for expectations. How many of you love to get up in the morning and have no idea what you're doing for the day? <laughs> Unless it means I'm alone somewhere on a beach, I'm totally cool with that. But otherwise, you know, it's like going to work and like we have a lot of work for you to do. I'm not telling you what that is. Um, you, when you get here, I'll just let you know and I'm gonna just keep giving you one thing after the other, right? And I'll let you know when you're finished. What do you think that would do to our behavior? Right. You might have verbal protests. You might just leave. You might tantrum. Um, you, depending on if you're getting paid or not, like you might impact, you might have that balance of is the benefit worth the experience, right? So it really, when we look at schedules, we all use, how many of you use a calendar? Appointment books? Right, a list for the day of what you need to get done. Right, so we use them for a reason because it helps us organize ourselves, it reduces anxiety, it helps us time manage. There are so many critical lifelong skills built into teaching a schedule. Um, and often, unfortunately, we feel like if a kiddo knows a routine, that's the same as following a schedule. They're actually two completely different parts of the brain. Um, learning to follow a schedule and time manage versus following a rote routine that's predictable, like walking in the door, taking off your backpack, putting away, sitting down at the table, operates on two completely different levels. So we want someone to look and know I have this to do, I have three more things, then I get to go to the park, right? Or I have two classes before my passing period to start really working on some of those, we talk about executive functioning skills, but really it's planning and organizing, right? To lead to ultimate independence. So the sequence is important for our kiddos, um, and we really need to teach it to them. And we also need to teach it and teach flexibility within it. Any of you work with or have children that are inflexible? Anyone? <laughs> right? So some people think, well, Amber, if I give them a schedule, then they're going to want to do that all the time, and I don't want them to know. You know, they worry about the inflexibility. Within the schedule, you actually can teach flexibility. You show changes in the day. You, you help them plan for those changes. And you show it to them visually and not just verbally, so they have a chance to really reflect and process. 
So picking the right schedule is kind of tricky sometimes. People get overwhelmed. This is that continuum of material. Um, I've just listed it here. And you guys know you have all of the sessions on your drives, right? I have to tell you, it does bother me that I'm doing a, a talk on visual supports, and we couldn't give you my PowerPoint slides as visual supports. Um, <laughs> just putting it out there. <laughs> Wasn't my doing, I'm <laughs> just saying. Um, but I think it's a little ironic because how better would you be processing, right? The information to reference? Okay, just had to say it. Um, so we can use real objects as schedules. You can use an object where you hand a kiddo a ball and the ball means they go outside to play and they match it to a ball when they get out there. So they hold the ball in their hand and they know that gives them concrete information where I'm going. You set the expectation, you obviously teach it and they match it. You can also use photographs. So taking real pictures of the items in their day or the kitchen area or the work area, their circle time area, whatever is within the classroom or in the home environment. You can make pictures colored like colored icons, or you can make them black and white. So this is progressive, right? Can you tell as I'm going through it? Um, developmentally, we're going from the most basic and clear to understand to the more abstract. So black and white, and then if they're readers, to written words, OK? If that's enough information for them. So what you want to think about is what your kiddo can access at a level of independence. That's where you start. You don't want the material itself to be stressful or inaccessible when you're teaching a schedule. Um, and then you can start with a simple schedule where you just show one picture, like we're going to the park, or we're going to go to grandma's house. Or you can have three, like first we have to go to the bank, right? And we're going to get in the car, um, and then we're going to stop at the store, and then I'm taking you to the park. So now I've clearly set the expectations. Instead of just rattling it off verbally, and then expecting them to know. And then what happens, what, you know when you know you need a schedule is when you have the Riddler in your back seat, right? Where are we going next? What about when are we going next? When are we going next? When are we going to get to the park? So usually, if you pay attention to others' behavior, their behavior will let you know when they need more information. So if I'm asking repeatedly, usually, there's a lot of different functions for that, but typically it's because I'm clarifying expectations over and over and over again. And I'm using you as my teacher or mom and dad as my regulator. I'm using you over and over to like confirm, confirm, confirm. And really the goal is we want them to utilize the support so they can be independent. So in the future when they're waiting for a bus and they wonder when it's coming, they learn to look to the schedule or the visual cue to get the information and not look around for a teacher or mom and dad. So schedules and setting that expectation is really important. Um, some kiddos need really detailed schedules and others. You can do bigger chunks of time, and that's where we really individualize. Everything I talk about today obviously is individualized for the unique needs of the learner you're working with. So you can have a single item, multiple items, or you can put the whole day on your schedule if the learner can handle that. So here's a couple examples of an object schedule. This doesn't have a pointer, but so this is in a classroom setting. The little bus area represents the, the um, arrival, the spoon they take to the table for snack. I can't see the other one. But so these are just Velcroed on. So instead of having an icon or a photo, they're taking the object. And typically, you match object to object if your kiddo's at an object level or your adult's at an object level. Um, and then there's the real, this one is a single item. This was actually from my classroom years ago. So we had a tote, and so we'd hand the tennis ball. This little girl loved tennis. So then she'd take it out and match it, and then actually play a game of bouncing with it so it was meaningful to her. It wasn't just an object. Um, and then the little toilet roll represents the bathroom, a cup for snack, and she actually would take her object out and take it to snack, and that was her drink she would drink from. So everything was really functional and meaningful for this kiddo. Um, then there's examples of real photos, which is pretty straightforward, right? We take a picture of the real item and we put it on the schedule. These are examples of schedules that have more items on them. So bathroom, snack, lunch, play area. And then we have more complex and more advanced schedules that have written words with them. So the icon with the word. And you notice you can change the size, too, based on the needs of your child or student. You can change the size of the icons. Um, there's a schedule down at the bottom. You can see that's a schedule for um, what they need to do after waking up. 
that sequences everything for them. And then the most advanced, which is kind of what most of us walk around with, right, is our written schedule, our written word schedule. So we go from the most basic to the most complex. Any questions about schedules? Okay, so I'm, like I said, I'm gonna give you some resources that are really great that will lay out if you're like, okay, this is what I wanna start at home, that you can actually watch something that takes you through how to get started. Remember, these are helping sequence events in our day, organize, show preferred. I'll talk about it first then, but also it's, it's nice to show if a child wants to do something that they really enjoy, what's coming before it. Um, the other important thing I didn't talk about for a schedule, you always wanna make sure that there's a way to indicate things are finished. So you can cross off, check off, or pull off. How many of you love crossing things off a list, right? You know what I actually do? If I do something I didn't put on my list, I put it on the list, and then I cross it off. I do, and I'm like, look it, I did amazing, and then I still have all the stuff I didn't do, but I, I at least had a visual to show what I completed. Um, so you want to pull off, some of these are pull off, mark off. I actually, when I'm working with students, let them decide if they're able to participate in the development, if you want to tear it off, put a check mark, check it off. Dry erase boards are really great. Um, for written schedules, you can write it on and then have them erase it. A lot of kids, the re eraser is reinforcing and it's a super easy schedule to manage. You can take it with you anywhere. You can write on what you're, what you're going to do next. So there are a lot of different things you can do with schedules. So a couple of things, these are going to be consistent, but you need to determine the type. You want to figure out where you're going to keep it in your home. You need to make a plan. Really, my goal is to teach you to make a plan. So think about the plan before you ever start using a support. Or sometimes we get frustrated, overwhelmed, or it seems like impossible to complete. So think about your plan first. What's important in your home or in your classroom? What do you think the schedule should look like? Where are you going to put it? Can they carry it with them? Should you hang it on a wall, right? So have that in place, and then think about what you're going to make and put it together, and then really take the time to teach your child how to access it. Make it fun. Start really simple. So when I'm first teaching schedules, I'll put like three things the kids love. Look, we're going to do Legos. We're finished. Take it off. We're going to play with the baby doll. Like not like we're going to go to the dentist, and then you're going to go grocery shopping, and then get your hair cut, because those are all things they love. Um, <clears throat> so you want to connect it, right? All of our learning, as humans, our learning experiences are shaped by the value and the reinforcement. So when we're first teaching any skill, if we can teach it in a positive reinforcing, the odds of it being something they're going to access and attend to is greatly increased, okay? All right, so rules. Rules is really simple, <clears throat> but important. Um, and a couple things I just want to highlight in this category. So we, rules, you show the expectations of the setting or the activity. Uh, you state the expectation in positive language. This is probably one of my things. <laughs> I have a few, I'm sure. Um, so use loving hands and feet, say please and thank you. And these are family rules I took to share. Um, use nice words, share, listen and do what I'm told. Versus no hitting, no yelling, right? No stealing. Do you see the difference in the language? So when we're looking at teaching new behaviors, we have to be mindful of the, the language and the focus of our language. So if I'm always talking about it's saying the word hitting, like stop hitting, no hitting, how am I giving any airtime to what's expected, right? So if I want, if, okay, she doesn't want me to hit, but what the heck am I supposed to do? He's got my toy, right? So if I just say stop hitting, I'm doing what I know. And so when we're teaching new behaviors and setting expectations, the expectation shouldn't be a removal of a negative. The expectation should be the positive. Does that make sense? So nice words or help or ask for help instead of stating no hitting, no kicking. And that's a big switch for some folks, the language, but our language is powerful. And, and if we're using the word hitting all the time when we're talking to a kid and we're not talking about the other things they can do, like ask mommy for help, they're never getting that information. So that's just one big thing for setting expectations. I always say when I go into rooms, well, I'm, it's really clear what they can't do. What should they be doing, right? When I look in classrooms, a lot of classrooms are like, do not get out of your chair, do not talk when the teacher's talking, those types of statements. <clears throat> There's also some great examples of community and school rules. So some 
learners need help within the community, a reminder, it's not enough that we say stop and look both ways. Some um, adults and children, we need to show them the visual when we get to the crosswalk and really go through it with them. So you might have rules for that. You might have rules for getting in the car um, or for different events and activities. So think about your expectations and what you want, um, what you want to show within that, the rules. So those are pretty simple. Some families post them on their fridge, right? Um, to give them on magnets, make a visual, put it on their fridge for some rules or expectations or in the car, things that you might be repeating to them. So just really think about what's necessary and what's needed for your learner, for your child, for your student. All right, this next one, it's first then. Show of hands again, how many of you used first thens before? Okay, so this is one of the most basic visual supports with really high payoff. How many people have friends that have told them, okay, first we're gonna go this, and then I promise, I'll come over. First I have to do this, and then we use it in our language all the time. It's because it sets an expectation to whoever we're talking to, right? It lets you know, I, I understand that that's what we wanna do, but I really have to do this first. Instead of just saying, yeah, later, 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 so do you know what later means to kids in school and in the house? Never. It's really what it means. We've shaped that behavior really well because we forget, not intentionally, I'll give us all the benefit of the doubt, but <clears throat> later typically means never. So does wait, which is why we have to reteach it and let them know waiting actually has an outcome. So first thens really can help set the expectation. Different than schedules, which we talked about that have more items on them, first then is typically unique to the situation you're in. So maybe you'll use it in the car or during a difficult transition or if in the classroom, at the table, at the desk. If you know a student enjoys a different activity that they're going to ask for all the time, you're going to set that first we're going to count and then we get the Play-Doh, right? So it's a really simplistic way of setting the sequence and the expectation. A more advanced, you can have just a first then, which is what I recommend everyone starts with, or you can have first next then. So if you feel like the, the individual can handle more items until they get to the then. Just like I talked about with the schedule, you need to teach this first positive. So first, if you have someone who loves to cook and then loves to help you outside with your plants or loves to play with Play-Doh and then loves to play in the kitchen, I would do a first Play-Doh and then we get to go in the kitchen. <clears throat> you want to attach the value to the support with something really reinforcing and not making them first have to wait for a high preferred. So the value and the importance in these visual supports is really how we teach it. So when I say make a plan, I want you to think about that. Give your ta yourself time and space to make that plan, right? Don't try to do a bunch of things at once. Do it well initially and give yourself a little bit of time to figure out what that looks like. So here's other examples of first toilet, then blocks, first washing hands, and then truck. And then an example of one we used for a kiddo who had a really hard time going to the doctor. Um, I don't know why this is on a loop, but um, years ago, and if you said the word doctor, if you saw white coats, like huge, huge difficulty, right? He definitely was clear. That was not what he wanted to do. Um, but sometimes that choice is not an option. So he was obsessed with McDonald fries. Obsessed. So initially his mom would say, I try telling him first and I promise I'll get you fries. But then the entire time, I can't get this stop. The entire time he would just be like, fries, fries, fries. And it became like a huge, because no one was, he didn't feel like people were really honoring his request, right? So we came up with a basic first then. And we did, we just did a drive by the doctor's office. We got in the car, we're like, first car, then da, hi doctor, then fries. Like it was super quick. And then we added time and expanded what he was able to do. So think about your child, your student, and maybe there's situations where they could really benefit from clearly seeing what you're saying. Remember, we're trying to take what we're saying and make it visual. There's a really great app called the First Then Visual Schedule. This one, I think, is a paid one. I do have a couple of resources at the end that aren't paid. But this one I really like because you can take your own photos. You can use it as a schedule. You can label it with what you want. You can embed videos in it if you want them to see what's happening. Um, so you can do a basic first then. You can do a full schedule. They can swipe it and it can go away. Yeah, so it's great. And it's called, I think I have a first then visual schedule HD. Um, 
Just one that's easy to use. I've got responses from families that this is one. There's a lot out there, but this one seems to be pretty user friendly. All right, so if that's something, or you use your phone, or you have it with you, and that's something that your child or student or learner can access, that might be more realistic to have with you. So same type of information, right, when we went over the schedules. Really identify those activities you feel like this would be beneficial. Um, the first picture is usually an activity that they complete. The next is the preferred. You're going to want to teach it in a positive setting. You're going to make it really fun to start with, and you need to be consistent. So you need to make sure you honor the first then, because we don't want them to think first then means never. right? We want it to have meaning. And the only way we give it meaning is by kind of setting the deal and then honoring it with them. And that means they get to do the activity. We'll talk about visual timers in a little bit, but um, <clears throat> something people do too, they'll attach a timer to the item that they're waiting for, so that gives the individual more information about how long they can expect to be able to play on the computer or play with the, the iPad. All right, our next visual is choice boards. So choice boards, um, <clears throat> really, I talked about earlier menu, right? When we go to restaurants, that's our choice board. Starbucks? And they change that choice board all the time, make it really visual and appealing. How many of you have ordered something on a menu you didn't plan to because it had a really cool picture, or they looked, they looked really nice, right? The power of visual supports. So all of a sudden, it gives you information like, that's available. I didn't know it was. It looks really great. But if I saw it in print, I'm not sure I would have ordered it. But when they make it look amazing, with like all the whipped cream and toppings at Starbucks, and I was going in there for some skinny coffee that I should be drinking. Um, so the visual, there's a reason why it's in our whole world, right? It gives information, it draws our attention. So choice boards, like anything else, are important for learners who need to have clear information on what's available. Choice board sets that expectation. Some families use these within the kitchen, the mealtime, the home, and snacks um, to identify what are available options. Um, choice boards can be used for movies, what they can choose to play with. In school settings, a lot of teachers use them in circle time or art. Um, so can we give choices verbally? Sure. Can some learners access that? Of course. But when you start having a lot of verbal information, and if you have an individual who that's not a strength to get all that auditory information and also complete something you're asking them to do, if we can take that information we're saying and make it visual, the odds are we're gonna increase their access and ultimately our goal again is independence. So we wanna know. We also wanna teach them when they go to a restaurant to understand that that is their natural world choice board. You look for what's available. When I go to sushi, I typically can't order mac and cheese. Although, there's some really interesting restaurants out there nowadays that have like burgers and sushi and Thai and everything wrapped, in, <laughs> wrapped into one. Um, have you noticed too, like in the big restaurants, BJ's, they use the photos, the photographs, so adding additional content. Could you imagine on these big restaurants if they didn't have visuals to go with all that text? Because their menu's crazy, right? Color coding. All of that is for typical learners and typical adults to access information and access it quickly. So for choice boards, you think about what that, what that might mean. Um, it's going to facilitate functional communication, too. So for our learners who have limited verbal language, the ability to make a choice from a picture and hand it to someone is really clear. Um, just like our activity in the beginning, right? Some of us didn't know the words and didn't speak multiple languages, but as soon as the picture was there, if you handed me the picture of breakfast, I would know you were asking for breakfast um, and might not have otherwise understood it if it was you were just talking or using or stating the word in a different language. Also, it places the decision in control with the child and the learner, and that's really our goal. We want individuals to learn to make a choice to learn what's available and unavailable, and be able to make a choice from those options. So this can be super simple. Um, <clears throat> it can look a lot of different ways. It can be in your, like I said, play area or kitchen. This is another app at the top. Uh, I'm going to have to get that one for you, the, where I pulled that from. But you can download like options for lunch to choose from. You know in the cafeteria, for those of you who are teachers or professionals, when they go in, there's a list or it's read aloud. For a lot of our learners, that's hard to access. They don't know what that is. But if you have a photo and you actually can show them, this is available for lunch, we actually get to give them the same choice everybody else is getting. 
just by making a verbal request or hearing it auditorily, and that's our goal. Um, so we want them to be able to access that. So choice boards is another really simple support that can facilitate communication and set expectations. Okay, help break and wait. A couple of you raised your hands when you were teaching these, um, having utilized these visual supports before. Um, there's a lot of different versions of help break and wait or what they look like. These are ones that were made for this conference and ones that you can make in the make and take. You can also make a choice board in the make and take as well. Um, help break and wait. They really teach critical listening and speaking skills that a lot of our learners need, children and adults. A lot of my friends need these. I bust them out when I need, <laughs> I need a break from them. No, um, so we really need to teach these skills. And oftentimes we do it verbally, especially wait, right? We talk about wait, you need to wait, and wait is one of those other things that means never. But what I love about these type of portable cues is they can be available across the day. You can access it when you don't know you were otherwise gonna need it, and then it, they can be available for you. So first let's talk about teaching wait. This is a skill we need to teach systematically, and you start with really small intervals of time. So I worked with a teacher once who I talked about the weight card, and then I came back and she said it didn't work because he wanted a toy. She said he he'd never had taught it before. Put it down, you have to wait, and it was like he had to wait 30 minutes. Um, so we kind of brainstormed that, right? <laughs> what that could look like. But really how I use wait when I'm first teaching it, I use it for my own behavior first to model. Like, oh, you guys came and sat down, or oh, you're at the kitchen table ready for breakfast. Shoot, I forgot something, can you wait? And I just put it down, and I go to get something, and I come back, I pull it back, and I'm like, that was great waiting, and I continue on. If I'm teaching a lesson in a classroom, I'm like, oh, can you guys wait? I forgot my pencil over here. I put it on this. So I pair the visual with waiting when it has to do with my behavior and me not asking them to wait for something that's preferred, right? Because once again, I'm trying to make the connection, the association between the visual support and the meaning behind it, and I don't want to have to deal with a competing behavior because my goal is to be supportive and positive and for them to buy into the visual supports. Um, then you're going to end up doing it with the learner, the adult or the child, in this situation where you feel like waiting is really difficult, that they're struggling, or their inability to wait is limiting their access to other activities, right? That's our goal. I don't need to teach this wait card or have someone wait just to teach it because I can't wait to make people wait, right? Um, it really is teaching it so when they need to wait in a situation, that they are able to do that in a way that still gives them access to that activity, that they still can do all the things that they want to do. And this is a critical skill. And a lot of our learners with differing abilities really struggle with this skill, being able to wait and wait well. So then you just work up to longer periods of time. Right? You start really small. I'll do silly things like, oh, you wanted that? Hold on, can you wait a second? I'll reach back and be like, that's great, and I do an exchange, probably under 15, 20 seconds. And you pair that, and you pair that, and eventually you build up to longer periods of time. You always, when we're working and teaching any new skill, it's just like us. We want to start and make sure we're teaching it where we're going to keep them successful and not frustrated, and then gradually build the skill set. I had a friend who tried to teach me snowboarding, it's a bad decision, but a really good friend uh, to try to, but initially, if she would have taken me to the top of the mogul, so that's what you call them, right, the hills with the, what do you think I would, I probably would have just like gotten out of it if I knew how, which I didn't, because she put me in the darn thing and I couldn't even get myself out of it, but instead we started at the little slope, right, and I'm like, oh, this is kind of good. We got that, I'm okay, so she gradually increased it. If I would have fallen I fell a lot, which is why I didn't enjoy it. But initially, <laughs> if I would have fallen five times in the beginning, do you think I would have said, this is amazing. Let's go for a bigger hill. No, right? I wouldn't have been reinforced. Nothing about the new experience would have kept me engaged and maintained my interest long enough for me to learn the skill, right? So I learned, it's real loose, on how to kind of get down a hill without killing myself. Um, a couple times, and then I was actually able to make a choice if it's something I wanted to do or not. In skills teaching, that's the goal too, right? We need to make sure we support enough so they can master and learn the skill. They know where to utilize it, and they know when they need it. So always start small, always build up to success, and make sure you keep your learner and your student engaged. 
Um, so using the weight card is really concrete. So it might seem silly handling, handing them a simple card, but it actually mediates the exchange you just had with them. I heard you, you wanted something, I understand, I'm gonna ask you to wait. And then you take the wait card back as an exchange when they're able to access the activity. So instead of it kind of being this really abstract process of I ask for wait, um, or I ask for computer and my mom told me I have to wait and I don't know what that means, I don't know if she even remembered, I don't know how long, you're really incorporating um, a concrete visual support to help with that process. You can also put the item like this picture shows on the top of the wait card, what they're waiting for to remind them. A lot of families put it on their fridge, like if kiddos have to do some chores or have some homework to do first. Um, if you're using the first then, you could do that. Or if you wanted them to take a break, like say from video games, um, you could put that on here and tell them wait and attach a timer to it and then if they come to you and like can I have it now you can be like I don't know you should go check the timer in your wait card so once again they're using the visual support to get information and they're not using you to get that information um, and that's what's going to lead to greater independence as they get older so here's an example of the time timer anybody have this time timer so timetimer.com uh, is the source here um, you can download this as an app on your phone. They have watches now for kiddos to use. They have digital watches. You can set it that it vibrates on their wrist when they know the time's up and doesn't make a sound. Oh, I did not put this on a rotating thing. Um, <clears throat> so. I would, if it's something you feel like you need a visual timer, some learners can access the digital timers just fine and you don't need the visual. But one thing that's great about the visual timer is obviously the visual red that slowly disappears as our time is passing. So it gives more understanding about time and the passing of time. Okay, break card is another one. Very similar teaching practice to weight cards, so I'm not gonna talk through that again. It's the same idea. Um, you're going to wanna incorporate it um, really systematically. Using a break card is often used with individuals when they're learning to self-regulate, um, but first we have to teach them how. So really using the break card when you identify that your child or student is having a difficult time in a specific situation, um, that they might need a break away from something before they come back. Oftentimes the visual alone is enough of a cue once you teach it for students to really kind of understand that they can walk away, they can go outside, they can go sit in a beanbag chair. If you have a quiet and calm place within your home or in your classroom, the goal really with teaching the break card is to intervene before the learner is really um, upset and already kind of agitated. It's harder to intervene when we're more in the cycle than it is earlier, so really paying attention to those early cues. Um, <clears throat> teaching break two, what I would teach it in really small ways first. I wouldn't ever sab purposely sabotage and set up a situation that would be frustrating, but if you know one's coming, I would kind of front load and be like, you know, when we get out there, if that dog's out there and it's really upsetting, you can take a break. You can just show me this and we can go take a walk, or you can walk inside and you don't even have to say anything. One thing that's really powerful with the break card with learners I've worked with is it takes out the need of written or verbal information. So in instead of someone having to come and tell me you know, Amber, I need a break, I'm really mad, I'm gonna go inside. Odds are, if they had that ability in the moment, we probably wouldn't be considering a break card, right? If I had an individual I'm working with that could do that and tell me how they're feeling and then ask for space appropriately, they probably already have a pretty well-advanced ability to self-regulate. So the break card allows some learners to be able to hand it or to give you some sort of sign or cue to let you know they're kind of reaching their level, they need a break, and you've had a previous agreement that they can go take space in a safe spot. Um, I had a learner in high school who obviously I didn't use this card with. Um, we had different color code stickies, so back to the stickies I showed you earlier, and he put it on the corner of his desk to let the teacher know kind of his level of frustration within the classroom. And he had a little sticky system and it didn't look different on his desk. None of the other students around knew. And we kind of taught it to him and modeled, he practiced it. So when he had a sequence of the sticky cards he put on, the teacher knew that meant he needed a break and she would just nod and he was allowed to get up and go outside. And he kind of had a set thing. He could walk around campus or do 10 wall push-ups. He would go to the office and ask them if they had anything they needed to shred. So it was something obviously we taught over time that just didn't happen because we pulled out a sticky. Um, 
but it's really identifying the needs of your learner first and where they might need help and might utilize this visual support. Last one for the teaching cues is the helping hand. Um, so the helping hand is just really an ability to communicate um, that they need help without using spoken language. So this would be a speaker skill. So meaning they hand you the helping hand. I think I dropped it. Um, they hand it to you when they need help to let you know they need help if they're unable to verbally request help, either because they don't have um, verbal language or because they're really frustrated or upset. Um, I have some classrooms, I've, we've utilized this support and then a gen ed teacher for first grade put it on all the kids' desks and they moved it from the left corner to the right and then instead of raising their hand and when she walked around the room, she knew who needed help and just incorporated it that way to manage it. So there's a lot of these supports that can be used across settings. So same thing, you're gonna teach the helping hand and model it like you would the others, especially the weight card. Um, Having it on their desk or in the kitchen or in the bathroom or in an area that's frustrating for the individual is also a reminder to the learner that they can ask for help. So the ability to know, our ability to know who we can ask for help requires perspective taking, which for some individuals is not fully developed. So it means I need to know that you might have more information than I do. Um, have any of you had to ask for help today? Who did you, how did you know who to ask for help? Anyone, how'd you know? Oh, like Miss Becky in the back and Jessica? So the visual support of the shirt, right? Immediately put people in categories for you without, I didn't sit you down early this morning and say, kid today, there's gonna be some people in blue shirts. Those are the people you can talk to. We didn't have to do that because the power of the visual and the color and the association with check-in immediately triggered and you knew that those were people that maybe might know something, hopefully. There's a reason why I'm not wearing one, so don't ask me anything. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> so we go to those people and we ask for help and we self-advocate and we know that we need to get that help, right? So there's that reminder to know who you can go for. For some of our learners, they might not know that the, blue, the people in the blue shirts, they don't have that perspective that they might have information because they, they lack that. They don't understand who they can ask for help. So sometimes we have to first teach that, like who you can ask for help, who has information you might not have. That's a component of asking for help. Usually the people we seek out for help is because we know that they have different information than we do, right? There's a reason why when I need help with my phone, I go into the AT&T store and I don't go next door to Wells Fargo. Because I have a lens and an understanding that when I go in here, these people on this counter, I have that perspective that they're gonna know hopefully more about my phone and they can help me, right, than anybody else. So that goes along with teaching help and we need to remember that for some of our students. Some of our learners and some of our children might not be ready for this because we first have to teach them you know, what it means to even know who to ask for help. And then token boards. So this is just, I included it in visual supports. Um, it's just kind of a brief introduction. It's usually connected a lot with behavior teaching and behavior interventions and increasing positive behaviors. We do have token boards you can make in the make and take as well, but really it's a visual cue to show um, progress towards earning something, a positive reward. So it's really visual for an individual to understand how much they need to do or how much work they need to complete, how many tasks they need to complete to, you, to earn a reward. Um, so tokens are earned by engaging in desired behaviors. I really encourage um, not to remove tokens once they're earned. So it is an intervention and a strategy, but for most learners, um, I believe once it's earned, it should be earned. So let's say you go to work, uh, three weeks out of the month, you do a great job, and for one week, you make a ton of mistakes. You know what, I just decided I'm gonna pay you half of your paycheck. How would that go over? No. Response cost um, and direct response to behavior, long-term shaping behavior, I think we need to think about if it's earned and it was an agreement and we had a contract, they get to keep the token. Maybe it takes you a little longer to get the next one, but you definitely earned that first one. Right? So sometimes, unfortunately, when we have tokens that are being earned and then a student's having difficulty or a child's, we tend to be like, oh, you just kicked again, you lost that token. Oh. Um, typically doesn't work well <laughs> in this situation. Um, and we're not doing a lot of teaching, 
right? We're not doing a lot of teaching and working on shaping that behavior. So think of token economies and reinforcement as positive, which means always giving, and I would be really, really, really cautious to remove things that have been earned. Um, a token board I view as a contract you enter into with an individual when you set it up. So if they say, Mom, I want to go get ice cream, and you say, okay, that's great. Remember, we have these five chores, and when you finish those five chores, we're going to go get your ice cream. And you have a picture of ice cream, and you have the five dots. So as they finish the chore, that's great. You put it on. They eventually get the five tokens, and then the reinforcement needs to be pretty immediate. So great job, you finished your chores. What did you say we're gonna get? Ice cream, they pull it off. You get in the car and you go get ice cream or it's in the freezer, wherever. So that is how like systematically to really show the earning and the process because five chores could sound like a lot, right? And then they just stop midway if they don't see. Also with token boards, I always recommend starting really um, small. So I'll load the board first with everything but one token on the board, and so they're already, they only have to do one thing. If you're teaching the token board for the first thing time and then make it a really easy task, you did a great job, you and your token, look, you have all five or all 10, what did you earn? And then you gradually build up from there. Um, it's another easy way to teach it in a positive context. Here's some examples of token boards. You can do the one in the middle, the iPad, those pictures are pictures of the actual item that they're earning, and they're cut up in all different pieces. So they earn pieces of the, the icon, the thing they want, and then they build it. I had an example of one. Yeah, they're really great, because you could honestly, you just cut it out, and you can put contact paper on it. If you don't even need laminator, cut it in pieces, have them put it together when they've built their iPad or built their PlayStation or whatever it might be, their puzzle, then they get access to it. And it's really clear. And the, then the token board itself sometimes is reinforcing, right? The idea of it's a highly preferred, I get to see it, I get to build it and put it together. The other thing I like about these that I've done before is if a kiddo was working too fast and I had the last piece over there, I just went and cut it. <laughs> I had two tokens. Um, so it still was the whole picture he knew he was building, but I got two more and he was working really well. I got two more um, times that I could reinforce him before he was going to take his break on the, the desired item, the reinforcer. It's also really important for token boards to work in reinforcer. Reinforcer, by definition, is something um, in this situation that a child is interested and chooses and they, they want it. That's where the motivation comes in. So it's not something we put on the token board without asking or otherwise having the individual let us know. So we don't say, I think you really like popcorn today, you're going to work for popcorn, and then we're shocked that they don't earn any tokens, right? When in fact they don't want any popcorn. So reinforcers are reinforcers, they're unique to the individual, they're unique to the setting, they're unique to the time of day. So we just always need to make sure with reinforcement that we, we know it's a motivator for our kiddos when we're working with them. We have um, token boards you can make too in the make and take. Okay, so brief wrap up of the visual supports. I did warn you, that was a quick exposure to a bunch of different type of supports. I do have resources for you where you can go get more in depth information and systematic ways to kind of walk through each of these. There's a couple great free websites for um, professionals and parents to access that are really incredible to get this information. You can watch it at your own pace. There's planning tools. So like I said in the beginning, my goal is just to expose you to these, kind of plant a seed, maybe start thinking about some ideas, and then give you some resources to get that information. <clears throat> Okay, so one of them is the Autism Focused Intervention Resources and Modules website. Affirm, anyone here been on Affirm before? <gasps> oh, <okay. laughs> Aubin, that doesn't count. Um, okay, so uh, Affirm is an amazing website, totally free to access. They're gonna ask you for your email. Um, they don't send you a bunch of stuff, they just can then track. Um, they can track all of the um, users and make sure people are accessing it. So it takes the evidence-based practices that have been identified. There's a module for everyone. And it, you can click on it. There's one on visual supports. There's one on video modeling. There's one on picture exchange communication system. It's all the evidence-based practices. It gives you planning tools, like the one listed on the side here, the tips. There's a parent resource sheet. There's a planning tool on how to put it into place. There's a lot, it's an amazing free resource that you definitely should know about and access. 
Okay, so obviously some of the things we've already talked about, but it's a great resource. The website's listed um, on that slide. So on your USB drives, you can access that and you have it. They have a couple videos and they go around the whole house and give you ideas for visual supports and show you what they've done. It's amazing. So I definitely would check out that website. So those are a couple resources for visual supports. The Affirm page modules, like I said, it's not just visual supports. That happens to be one of their modules. They also have one on social narratives, which I'm gonna briefly talk about right now. Um, and then we can, I wanna make sure I leave enough time for questions and to show you some other resources. So social narratives, um, really the goal of the next couple of slides is just to kind of give you an idea of this, this tool and this strategy, and it might be something that would be meaningful to utilize within the home or school setting. How many of you have used social narratives or social stories? Before? Okay, great. Great. How many have written them? You've written them? Perfect. Okay. So uh, you need to know first that um, <clears throat> the information I'm sharing from you is coming from, from Carol Gray, and this is her book, her new book on social stories. Um, I'm sharing some basic information with you about developing social stories. It is definitely not the same as receiving a training from her or reading her book or her text. So just to give you information that might be something you might want to know more about and you have a good place to go look for it. So social stories, I love them because I feel like they create a snapshot for a situation that could be difficult for a learner to process. It's like I tell people to think of it as a visual snapshot, if you will, setting expectations of a situation that's about to happen. So you really identify some things within that context and situation that we really feel like the learner would need to know to understand and identify the expectations and then their choices within that setting. So they're typically really clear, super simple, and descriptive. It should be really obvious to anyone picking it up, like, oh, this is what's gonna happen, these are things I can expect, and these are some things I can do in this situation. That, in, in a nutshell, um, in a really simplistic way of explaining it. Um, I also really like them because you can write them on the fly. I've written them on whiteboards and on legal pads and walking in when I, th I know a situation's about to happen or a teacher shares something or a parent shares something with me. And our ultimate goal is to prepare the student or the learner ahead of time to support them within that situation so they can ultimately have some independent responses, right? And be able to access that environment in that situation. Um, it can be used to describe any event, social skills, complex concepts, social, some parents have written them when going to birthday parties or if going to a different doctor or um, family members coming over to the house unexpectedly or people within the home, any change in the routine, anything that might otherwise not be a typical experience or something they know to plan for. So any idea, what are some situations you've had with a child or student that you've thought a social story would work well for or that are difficult situations? Yeah. Going to the dentist. Yes, that's a big one. Yeah. Did you say going to a new school? Yep, going to a new school. Actually, one of our projects on Airb um, is about transition, and we have several social narratives about planning for the transition to the new school. That's huge. What else? Yeah. Mom leaving, going on a business trip. That's unexpected, right? The house is gonna be different. Some things around there are gonna be different. Dealing with bullying, that's a hard one, yep. Yeah, it really is. So social situations, it's another great way to utilize social stories, is social situations that they might be, pre be presented with things they don't know how to handle, and the goal is to tell them what that might look like and might feel like, and then give them some options. So those are all great examples. Um, my clicker's not moving. Did it move? Let's see. Um, so the whole story is developed to be supportive. The whole story is developed to be supportive, not directive. It is not a written task analysis. Social narratives are not our teaching plans or our lessons for morning routine or what we want them to do for breakfast in the house. Social stories are meant to be supportive and descriptive to set the scene and to give some expected behaviors. 
What we tend to do, I feel like as professionals sometimes, they're like, this is amazing, I'm gonna write everything in and then I will pick up my backpack, I will hang it up, I will say hi to my friend, I will, and I'm reading a task analysis that's written in a social narrative piece of paper, right? So just keep that in mind. We really want it to be simple information that paints the picture to support the student and it's not directive. It should tell them who, where, what, things to, what they can think about, um, what they might need to know um, in the given situation. Um, so, there are some basic sentences. This is going to be a quick overview of the sentences. It, you just need to know that a social narrative, by definition, has a specific structure to it, other than just being, say, a script or something you write down. So there are basic sentences. Um, the descriptive sentence is the only required sentence in a social narrative, one that describes, okay? There are perspective sentences, directive sentences, and then affirmative sentences. So real quick example, descriptive sentences obviously describe what's happening in a clear manner. These are examples. At school, the schedule changes during the week or sometimes we have visitors in our house, or it could be one for work. At work, the break room can get loud. Those are all just describing the situation, right? Not directing the learner. So that's a, a school, home, and work example. Um, sentences are um, perspective sentences, describe the feelings or internal perspective of others, and they're written in the first person. So some examples of this is students in my class like to help the substitute teacher. Or for a home one, my parents like it when I wash my hands. So do you see the perspective? It's the perspective of someone else than the learner that you're gauging it towards. Directive sentences gently coach the learner on what to do in the situation. And these are the sentences that really should be used sparingly, the directives, okay? So this is when we're providing a suggestion of what the learner can do in the environment. So an example could be, I will try to raise my hand before talking. I can greet my parents' friends when they come over, or I will work on asking coworkers for help. So if you notice, they're not written like, ask a coworker for help. Greet your parents' friends. So it's really meant to be if you were telling a story with the most important information. And then affirming sentences just enhance the meaning and overall context of the story. Um, so you might say this is the right thing to do, or this will help with organization, or this is what is expected. So something that kind of just affirms the, the social expectations within that context. So overall, the ratio of sentences should be more descriptive, right, to um, directive. So you want to have um, greater than, well, this is a hard to, greater than two. So you don't want to have more than two directive sentences um, within the context. So I have an example of one here. Uh, at school, we have recess, and then I label the type of sentence it is next to it, right? So at school, we have recess. That's descriptive. Most of the time, we go outside. Descriptive, sometimes we have recess indoors. Is that still descriptive? Yep, just telling them what happens. Our teacher tells us when to stay inside for recess. And then here's a directive. I can pick one toy or game to play with. So that's like that expectation, what I can do within that context. Um, I can play the game by myself or with a friend. So now I know really clearly, if I was going to help in your, in your house or in your classroom and you gave me this, I would know what to expect during rainy day recess, right? I would be like, oh, they can pick a toy and they get to play alone or with themselves. So you always know if you've written a really good social narrative, if it's somewhat short, because we don't need them long, you hand it to someone else and it's really clear to the person you gave it to what's expected and it's in a positive tone. And then we have a perspective affirming, this is what the class does at indoor recess and the perspective. My teacher is happy when I play quietly. Okay, so just a real basic example. Um, in your packet, and then the ratio here, I have there's six descriptive, affirming, and perspective sentences and two directive, which puts me at three, which is greater than two, and that's the ratio you need to be at when you're writing a social narrative. Does that make sense? So you do your total number of sentences, you look at your ratio, and you always want it to be greater than two. And that's an easy check if you feel like I'm telling them a lot of things to do. If you feel like there's a lot of important things within the context of a social situation and you're having a hard time balancing it, I just recommend you write a different one. Maybe there's different parts of the social situation you wanna break it apart, okay? 
So in your packet, you have a sample story for home as well, and you have a sample story um, to go through and really kind of practice. Really the most important part is that you're patient, you have a reassuring quality, and it teaches social understanding over rote compliance. That's why we have the affirming and perspective. We want them to understand the context and why maybe greeting someone who comes to the house is important. We just don't want to have them do it. How many of you love being told to do it and not, you're not told why? Anyone? Right? But sometimes I feel like we don't necessarily embed that in our teaching with our children and our students. We forget the why, the context. We just kind of teach a skill. But we know for lifelong independence, the skill taught within the context is what is functional and meaningful. And if we can make it functional and meaningful, we're going to have a greater Im impact for lifelong independence, knowing why something's happening. So. When you think about um, just things to consider as some takeaways, does your child need additional visual cues or is there a story to make something more meaningful, right? You can add visual supports to the story. I have a lot of um, families that take pictures and then write the sentence underneath. I just had a family write one about meeting new teachers at school and had like, I'm going to kindergarten, there's new teachers, this is, those are all descriptive. And the one directive was, I can say hi when I walk in the door and find my desk. But it was really a great way to kind of expose them to the transition to the new school. So adding visuals, like we've been talking about, can be really powerful. Um, social stories can be read to the learner, or the learner can actually learn to access and read them. We do recommend that you teach, and Carol goes over this in great detail, but this is like a lesson that you'd be teaching anything else. You set time up, you plan for which social stories are important, you have them read um, at ahead of time to prepare, so if you know there's a substitute teacher, or you know there's visitors, you don't do it right in that moment, you kind of front load it. Um, you're really setting that stage and usually if you have readers they can go through or we have kids at the end they're like rainy day recess is coming I can pick a I can pick a friend or not I can pick a toy and the idea is you're creating something that's external and unexpected to be more internal and they can process and know some of the expectations in that moment without needing to access you for that information again that's really the goal really trying to give them that foundation um, there is a great app for um, adding visuals to your story. I will make sure um, I have the, let's see, resource on the next one. Also on the Affirm modules, you can watch an entire module on social narratives. Um, to go through a planning checklist, writing it out, it has the grid on how to include the sentences and the types of sentences. You can actually, if you Google Carol Gray on YouTube, you can see a presentation of her talking about social narratives and get more information on that too. And here's some of the apps. These are included too, but these are great ones. So there's Social Story Creator, there's I Create, and Story Maker. So final thoughts, social narratives and visual supports can target a variety of skills. Hopefully that's something as a takeaway from today. You can target a multitude of different listener and speaker skills and teaching skills. Um, we really use visual skills to draw the learner's attention to relevant and important information. And teach them to access all of those visual so supports that you identified when we first started today. Um, flashing lights and traffic signs and cones out, really learning to pay attention to the visual supports in our everyday life, and then adding the extra level of visual supports that you feel like your child or student needs. Um, these strategies can be easily practiced across the day. I definitely encourage you to think about functional and meaningful. When is it meaningful to teach weight? When is it meaningful to have a choice board or functional for your student or your learner? Make sure it makes sense in the context. And then always modify any supports to meet the unique individual needs of the learner. So it can be objects like we talked about, photographs. It can be visual supports like post-its or highlighters are pretty powerful with our kids in classrooms to draw their attention to relevant information. So really consider what your child or student needs when developing the visual support. It is not a one-size-fits-all. If you made one schedule for one kid, that's that kiddo's schedule. That's not the schedule everybody else in your room should get. Or if your neighbor has a child and they made a schedule and they hand you that schedule because it worked for him, I wouldn't expect that same schedule to work for your child, right, if they have very different needs. So really think about your child or your student when you're developing this, and that's when you're going to see the greatest positive impact. And give yourself time to plan. Right? Plan, learn how to use it. If it's difficult at first, um, don't kind of throw it out. Try, try, try again. 
The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.